I will talk about the Schrodinger equation and the ground state wave function of the helium atom. Uh, the Schrodinger equation of the helium atom is H psi equals E psi. H is the Hamiltonian operator consisting of the kinetic energy operator and potential energy operator. The kinetic energy of electron 1 and the kinetic energy operator of electron 2 are included in this Schrodinger equation. The kinetic energy of the helium nucleus is much smaller and thus is neglected. Also, because of the born oppenheimer approximation, we can separate the motion of the nucleus from the motion of the electrons and recover the kinetic energy of the nucleus later in statistical thermodynamics. And we have two attraction terms between the two electrons and the nucleus. Also, there is a repulsion term between the two electrons. Using the four fundamental atomic units, the mass of the electron is 1, the charge of the electron is 1, h bar, the reduced constant is 1, and Coulomb's constant, 1 over 4 pi epsilon is 1. We simplify the Schrodinger equation. And then, if we look at this Schrodinger equation, there is no analytical solution because of the repulsion term between the two electrons. This term prevents us to separate the motion of electron 1 from the motion of electron 2, or the wave function from ele of electron 1 from the wave function of electron 2. So therefore, we have to solve this Schrodinger equation approximately using either the variational method or the self-consistent field method. Uh, there's one more thing. Because helium contains two electrons, it must obey quantum mechanical postulate 6, which says the wave function that describes a many electron system must change sign under the exchange of two electrons. So in short, psi 1, 2 should be negative psi 2, 1. Or we can say the wave function of a many electron system must be anti symmetric under the exchange of two electrons. To enforce this postulate, we must include electron spin in the wave function. So, what are the electron spin? The electrons not only orbit about nucleus, they also spin about their own axis. Uh, the situation is very much like the Earth orbiting about the Sun. And at the same time, the Earth rotates about its own axis. Now let's look at the electron spin. Unlike Earth, electrons can do three-dimensional rotation about its own x, y, and z axis. And the three-dimensional electron spin angular momentum operator is S with a carrot on top. The z component of the three-dimensional angular momentum is S sub z. The operator has also a carrot on top. Now let's look at these two operators. If we apply this S squared operator to alpha electrons, the result is S times S plus 1 times h bar squared times alpha. So alpha is an eigenfunction of S squared with an eigenvalue S times S plus 1 times h bar squared. Same for beta. And this S equals one half for both alpha and beta electrons. And therefore, we can easily plug in the value of S 
to get the eigen values for alpha electrons, which is three quarters of each bar squared, and also three quarters each bar squared for beta electrons. And remember, this eigenvalue corresponds to the angular momentum squared. Therefore, the magnitude of the three-dimensional angular momentum of the electron spin is the square root of 3 divided by 2 times h bar. What about the z component of the angular momentum of the electron spin? Now, it depends. If you have an alpha electron, the eigenvalue or the z component of the angular momentum is positive one half each bar. For beta electrons, negative half each bar. So alpha and beta correspond to just two different types of electrons. They differ in the z component of the three-dimensional angular momentum of the electron spin. And both alpha and beta are normalized. That means the integral of the squared modulus of alpha is 1. The integral of the squared modulus of beta is 1. Also, alpha and beta are orthogonal to each other. So it simply means the integral of the complex conjugate of alpha times beta is 0. The integral of the complex conjugate of beta times alpha is also 0. And over here, I used this d sigma, in which sigma is the spin coordinate of the electron. Now let's construct a two-electron anti-symmetric wave function for the helium atom using a determinant. Now why do we use a determinant? A determinant changes sign when we switch two rows or two columns. And therefore, you'll see, if we have this wave function of the two electrons in the helium atom to be a determinant, and we write out the determinant in the following manner. So first, we say these two electrons occupy two different one-electron orbitals, phi1 and phi2 here. All right, and then we write out phi1, phi2 in the first row, and also phi1 and phi2 in the second row. And then we write out the electrons. We put electron in phi1, and also we put electron in phi, uh, electron 1 in phi2. We put electron in phi1, and we put electron 2 in phi2. It sounds strange, but this determinant, again, enforces positive 6. Now if you swap the coordinates of the two electrons, so for example, if you exchange 1 with 2 and 2 with 1, the resulting uh, wave function is the opposite of the original wave function. Uh, what about this term? This term is a uh, simple normalization factor to ensure that the integral of the squared modulus of this 2 electron wave function is 2. Okay, if you have one electron, the integral of the squared modulus of the wave function is 1. If you have two electrons, then the integral of the squared modulus of the wave function is 2. Now, what is phi1? What is phi2? First, they have to be different. If they are the same, and then you are looking at two identical columns. Uh, any determinant with two identical columns or identical rows has a value of 0. So therefore, phi1 and phi2 must be different. And this is the reason we must introduce the electron spin, because now we say phi1 is the spatial orbital 1s orbital times alpha. Phi2 is the spatial atomic orbital, this 1s orbital times beta. And because alpha and beta are different, and then phi1 and phi2 are different. Uh, what is this so-called spatial orbital here? So imagine we have these two electrons, both occupying the 1s orbital. We should be able to somehow get the spatial distribution of the electrons. And from the solution to the hydrogen atom, we guess 
this one is orbital in the helium is also exponential function e to the power of negative z effective r what is this z effective this z sub effective if is the effective nuclear charge this two one is electrons field and uh, what's the value of this z effective it's got to be less than two because each electron feels the plus two charge on the nucleus and then also electron electron shielding therefore it's not going to be uh, two it's going to be less than two also it's going to be greater than one because of this uh, electron shielding being incomplete you cannot have one electron being completely shielded by the other electron so in this case the z effective is between one and two in general chemistry you know this value of z effective is 1.69 all right now we rewrite this determinant by plugging the wave function 1s times the spin function alpha or beta the result is complicated first you have the normalization factor and then you have the spatial orbital of the two electrons uh, which means electron 1 occupying the 1s orbital and electron 2 occupying the 1s orbital and then there's a spin function alpha 1 beta 2 minus beta 2 beta 1 alpha 2 here this is the spin function and this spatial function is symmetrical the spin function is anti-symmetrical uh, we can easily prove that the product is anti-symmetrical if we switch electron 1 with electron 2 the spatial function is symmetrical yet the spin function is anti-symmetrical 